understanding the nature of pain. It, it, and this is important. Is the pain intractable because of nociceptive stimuli? We talked about that. Is this real pain? Is it neuron? Is there actually afferent neurons that are involved in this so that this person has genuine pain of a level that any human being in this room? Yeah, it's going to fall around the curve. But say 90% of the human beings in this room would have a level 10 pain. Probably not. That, that's where we get confused. Everybody gets confused. Well, what kind of pain do you have? Well, I'm in really bad pain. What is really bad pain? I had really bad pain once when I had my prostate out after prostate cancer. I was sitting in bed and I got what's called a bladder spasm. And I sweated through my entire uh, mattress in about 48 seconds. And I had no idea what was going on. That was the kind of pain where you could barely do anything. I could barely breathe. I thought I was going to die of a heart attack. I certainly couldn't have talked to anybody about it. The nurse came in and looked at me and said, stretch out. And I went, okay. She said, stretched out and it went away. But that was level, you know, level 11 pain. So when people say they've got the most pain they've ever had, but you're looking at them and they're driving and they're falling asleep and they're doing things, that's not level 11 pain. Level 11 pain, you're like... You wish you were dead, it's beyond belief, okay? So we have to deal with this in that one of my friends actually gave this to the entire world. And have you all seen the little smiley faces with pain? That was created by a chiropractor who's a fighting E, only a local fighting E because of me. But he did that, he gave, did the original article on it, he just gave it to the world. He did not go out and get a patent, he did not try to sell it. Lord knows he could have. But he just gave it, and everyone uses it today. We all got those little smiley faces and unhappy faces and more unhappy faces. But let me tell you, when you, you get up to the extreme pains, you don't need any faces to figure it out. You, you won't be able to do anything. So if you've got someone who says they're in the extreme pain of their life and they're sleeping through the night, they're not in extreme pain. But you can't tell them that. But you've got to know that. And you still have to deal with their pain. So what else happens with their pain? Is the pain central? Have the spinal cord, brainstem, limbic system, and cortex been recruited as reverberating pain circuits? What the heck does that mean? It means that if something starts to hurt, like I had a kidney stone with Malada about uh, two months ago. We went somewhere and, I, and then I had to do another presentation and I started passing a kidney stone. Not a fun event really, but you can sleep if you're on heat. You know, after you're done with the dry heats and you get the right heat on you, you can sleep through that pain and take a little leave and Tylenol. You really don't need much more than that. But after you're all done and you don't have a kidney stone, I still get phantom pain. Stuff that goes on. Your, your, your system learns, and as it learns bad behavior, you get phantom things, just like phantom limbs. If we, if we lose a limb and we think it's still there, a pain is there and it goes away. You, you, your patients really do have problems with that pain and really do have phantom things that happen in their limbic system, their cortex, and it reverberates throughout the various circuits of the brain. Is the pain compliant, suffering, as in depression and delusional pain? I'm not sure why they put the word compliant there, but that's the way they look at it. So to me, that, that's a different kind of pain. That's super tentorial pain. I mean, when I was a young intern, we would always try to use fancy words to describe this that were derogatory to patients, which were wrong. We would say, oh, we need to get a porcelain level. We need to get a feather tiger. See how big a turkey they are. See how big a croc they are. Because it wasn't their medical problem that was creating their pain, which was wrong because this can be real pain that needs to be treated and taken away. But, you know, you're up 35 hours in, in a row and you're not thinking straight. And when you say things later, you go, oops. I wish I hadn't said that. This is, so that's where that comes up, and that's why, I, especially when I'm talking to other physicians, I'll make a big deal that depression and delusional pain may not be physical or nociceptive as we know them, but they trigger those same reverberations in your brain, and they have all those same sequelae, and they cause all the reactions that we've talked about when people have those kinds of pain, and you still have to treat it. Some of those you need to treat differently than you would treat some of the physical pain. They're very important. They're not unimportant. Which pain behavior occurring is the associated disability worse than the sensory pain itself? With pain behavior, right, right, okay. I said that wrong. Pain behavior occurring is the associated disability 
worse than the sensory pain itself. And that kind of leads from everything we've been talking about. That's part of what you have to figure out. And if it is worse, is it because of a psychiatric disorder? Is it because of a learned behavior? Is it a malingerer? Is it somebody getting secondary gain? There are all these different things going on in someone who has pain. There's six or seven things you have to start thinking about treating at once. But going back to the behavioral medicine format, I mentioned these, hypnosis and behavior medicine. Hypnosis works by endorphin-mediated response. That's been measured. There's lots of studies about that. Hypnosis candidates can be rated by suggestibility and eye roll. That's uh, David Spiegel is the expert in hypnosis at Stanford. His father, Herb Spiegel, I think, developed this suggestibility eye roll that has to do with hypnosis. And sometimes if you're a good hypnotist, you don't show any pupil at all. I don't know if any of you have tried this, but I'll show you what a level four looks like. And I don't know if it really, I don't even know if that really matters, but supposedly people that go like this and have just the white of their eye are supposed to be good hypnotists. And those that can't do it at all usually have more trouble with their hypnosis suggestibility and what goes on with that. Did you see my eyes? So you saw that? Some of you, you will attest to it. Some of you in the back probably didn't see that, but come by later and I'll show you the whites of my eyes. There it goes again. <laughs> All right. So hypnosis has to do with brain electrical activity. Pain is real versus unreal. Attention to pain and cortical modulation of both of these. Okay. Hypnosis treats anxiety, depression, and creates analgesia. These are kind of obvious. We've been kind of talking about that the whole time. So behavioral concepts that also have to deal with pain. These are some things you might think don't have anything to do with pain, right? Dietary concepts. Well, what do you think? If you eat about a 9,000 calorie a day diet and you just had your knee replaced, do you think it's going to be easier to get up and do your physical therapy? So, you know, what you eat, how much you eat, and the way you eat can certainly impact your recovery and your response with pain medications, pain treatments, and how you deal with different physicians as well. If someone comes in there when you're all bloated and would want to have a bowel movement, you're really not in the mood to discuss, you know, how your mother made you a little crazy. So the psychiatrist has to be a little considerate and be aware that there may be more going on than his taking a history, right? Drinking alcohol, that seems kind of obvious, doesn't it? Alcohol, it used to be felt that alcohol would definitely mess up all your medications, mess up your, your narcotics, mess up your antipsychotics or antidepressants or anxiolytics, that's all wrong. It, it doesn't mess them up, but it's certainly not good for them. They'll still work. You know, it used to be, especially a lot of my colleagues, you'd have someone who were on antidepressants or on mood stabilizers and they'd be drinking too much. You go, oh, I got to stop your meds. You're drinking too much. That was a disservice to the patient. They actually get worse from that. They, they don't get sober, obviously, drinking and doing their medications, but they actually have a better recovery time and can deal with their recovery in AA and everything else if you continue the medications and start to treat the addiction side of the problems. So, and this all, you know, with pain patients, it's always going to come up. You get a lot of pain patients because they fall in that little gap that I told you about. Doctors trying to not give too much medicine. Doctors trying to give too little medicine. And then what happens? You give too little, you give too much. You know, if you give too much, the guy's going to be asleep all the time or he can't breathe or he's comatose or people are complaining that he looks like he's drugged all the time. So you always start drinking alcohol and just start self-medicating. And, you know, that's not good either. So that's what goes on. And then you've got, obviously, THC. THC has its spot just like a glass of wine does, but unfortunately, it falls in the same category. You can do too much marijuana. And then you get the same problems as too much alcohol, and then you become a marijuana addict. Thanks to your generation, we now have enough THC in, in a joint where people can actually become addicts very easily. That never happened when I was a kid. There was hardly any drug in that drug. Anyway, we've corrected that problem. <laughs> so, and there's pre-existing factors. I mean, sometimes people come in and, yeah, they may have gotten a nail in their foot, but they were suicidally depressed before they got the nail in the foot. So, I mean, you know, a doctor may think, 
yeah, I'd, I'd want to kill myself too if I got a nail in my foot and miss the fact that this guy's got a psychotic depression and give him medication and not treat him aptly and not watch him and the guy will off himself. Because, you know, when you've already got a bad situation, what do you think is going to happen when something worse happens? You think it's going to make it better? Now, actually, in the gate theory, they have the opposite approach. They say it does make it better. So a little bit makes it better, but a lot doesn't. So poking a needle in you somewhere may get rid of some of your pain, but being psychotically depressed and then getting a nail in your foot, not a good thing. Okay, and personality factors. Obviously, people can either handle change in their life and can handle the fact that, you know, bad things happen to good people. I don't know. I'm going to say something dangerous, but I'm going to say it well. If you go see the Book of Mormon, you'll see some concepts about bad things happening to good people. It's an excellent play, and I will say no more about that. Um, using all of this to have an interdisciplinary approach for pain, anxiety, and stress is what I've been at the whole time. More behavioral concepts, I think I mentioned some of these, add biofeedback, try relaxation training, exercise, cognitive therapy, assertion training, supportive therapy with doctors and family, all to create a more positive patient. My favorite way of dealing with most patients is called family focus. So the patient comes in, there's a pain problem. I'm seeing the, you know, a couple of people in their family, maybe their kids and their spouse, and we're all helping this person. So they can't slide around as easily because their husband or their wife knows exactly what they're really about, and they'll, they'll nail them for me. I don't have to do it. So that makes my job easier. Then we can play good cop, bad cop, and I get to be the good cop. You know, and that can be helpful in terms of change and supportive psychotherapy. 